Dead America, Idaho, Part 5, Dead America, the Second Month, Book 11, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1 Darkness enveloped the community of Nampa, but did little to concede the horror raging outside. Only minutes had passed since the front gate was destroyed, letting the undead army inside to unleash havoc. Copeland stood by the window of the armory, a small house only a few blocks from the front entrance. A small camping lantern in the middle of the room provided just enough light for them to get around. Dennis and Karen joined him at the next window, looking out at the chaos they'd unleashed. From their vantage point, dozens of slow-moving zombies lumbered through the streets and yards of the neighborhood, with the occasional runner sprinting by in search of new victims. In the distance, gunshots cracked and screams echoed, but for the most part, it seemed that people were in hiding. How many runners do you think there are? Dennis whispered. Copeland shook his head. I don't know, he admitted. More than I want to deal with, though. Dennis took a deep breath. Look, man, I'm— Save it, the sergeant cut in sharply. Reality is, if you hadn't done what you did, I'd be lying dead in the yard. Still, we're in a bitch of a situation as a result. Dennis nodded and backed off the topic, not wanting to push it further. The crackle of Copeland's communicator interrupted them. Okay, we got this place locked down for the moment, Bretts reported. So now what? Mission priority is still taking out Harris the sergeant replied firmly. Secondary mission is now saving civilian captives and getting out of here in one piece. I'm assuming you did a number on the front entrance, the corporal said. So it's safe to assume Harris isn't getting out that way. Copeland nodded. Oh yeah, it's blown to shit and flooded with corpses, he said. My guess is he's going to evacuate the same way we came in. Those trucks are probably still there, and it's going to take some time for the horde to reach that point of the compound. I mean, it's what I'd do, Bretz agreed. I think we're five, six blocks from it. The sergeant sighed. I have no idea how we're moving the civilian captives, though, he admitted. Wade had a thought about that, Bretz replied quickly. Let me put him on. There was a brief silence, and then the sniper said, Hey, Sarge, good to see you're still kicking. Likewise, Copeland replied with a small smile. So, what you got? I saw a big industrial strength moving truck along the back wall when we were coming in, he explained. Should be big enough to punch through whatever is left at the front gate. The sergeant nodded thoughtfully. Okay, he finally said. I want you to go after Harris. Once you're done with that, meet me at the civilian house at the back of the compound. Only house with bars on the windows back there, so shouldn't be too hard to spot. I'll have those people ready to move. We're on it, Sarge, Wade promised. The line went dead, and Copeland continued staring out the window. Are you really going after those people? Karen asked shakily, and the sergeant nodded. Those people wanted safety, and instead got put into chains, he snarled. Just doesn't feel right leaving them behind to die. Dennis swallowed hard. What can we do to help? he asked. Stay here and keep this place secure, Copeland instructed firmly. I'm going to have enough trouble getting there without babysitting. The couple nodded in agreement, but before anyone could reply, gunshots cracked outside, and they all stiffened. Copeland looked out to the street, spotting three of the Chosen making a run for the armory. One of the men tripped over a zombie as he tried to push through a group, and the dead immediately pounded on him, devouring his horrific screams. One of the others turned back to help, but his friend grabbed his arm and pulled him away from the pack. We gotta let them in, right? Dennis asked hoarsely. We absolutely do not let them in, Karen cried. How could you say such a thing? He opened and closed his mouth and then finally stammered. I mean, if they get bitten, it means we just have to deal with more runners. I'm just trying to be practical. There were more gunshots in the distance, but Karen didn't even flinch. A raging gaze on her husband. You know what they did to me, right? She growled. They are not getting in here. She's right, Copeland said. Karen threw up her hands. Thank you, she said. But then again, so is he, the sergeant added, and the couple stared at him, confused and unsure. 
Copeland waited a few more moments for the two men to reach the front door of the house. When they made it, he flung it open, raised his handgun, and put a round in each of their heads before slamming the door shut again. He turned around at the wide-eyed faces of his companions, shock evident in their expressions. That was one way to deal with it, Dennis stammered. Brother, you need to listen to your woman more, Copeland said, and clapped him on the shoulder before moving back towards the window. Karen smacked Dennis in the chest with the back of her hand, eyebrows hitting her hairline in a clear, told you so gesture. Her husband begrudgingly nodded and then avoided her gaze. A few moments later the moans outside grew louder, putting the trio on edge. Several moments later the sounds of jaws munching on flesh smacked through the door, and Copeland closed the blinds as the ghouls feasted on the two still warm bodies on the front porch. He motioned for the couple to follow him to the kitchen silently, which was at the back of the house. They grabbed the light and moved, hoping to give the creatures outside nothing to focus on once they were done with their meal. Copeland walked over to the back window, looking out towards the direction of the civilians in need of rescue. The street was flooded with zombies, easily eighty or so with some runners still in the mix. A gunshot went off at a nearby house, and half a dozen ghouls sprinted off towards it. Copeland closed the curtains with a sigh. I am a badass, but I think I'm going to give that a few minutes to calm down, he muttered. Dennis peeked out the window, his eyes widening at the sight. Bud, you could be Captain America and have a hard time getting through that mess, he said. Those runners, man, he shook his head. Scary as hell. Tell me about it, the sergeant replied gruffly. Lost count the number of good men we've lost to those things. Karen shuddered. We lost pretty much our entire apartment building to them, she whispered, and clenched her jaw. Dennis reached out and curled an arm around her as a sob racked her body, and she shook her head furiously. I'm sorry, she said hoarsely. Baby, it's okay. You let it out. Dennis cooed, folding her into his chest. He rested his chin on her head and addressed Copeland. We thought we had a plan, you know, like I'm sure everyone did. Karen was between jobs when all this started. Had been for months. To keep herself busy, she'd help out the other tenants. Run some errands while they were at work. Feed their dog if they were running late. That kind of stuff. When people started getting sick, she helped out then too. Had about a third of the building come down with it. Almost at the same time. Luckily, we had a bit of a window between finding out what was happening and when they turned. So we quarantined the sick. When the inevitable happened, we did what needed to be done taking them out one at a time. He swallowed hard, his gaze darkening as he gritted his teeth. But that one dumbass kid, Chuck, he shook his head. Hot shot, little punk. Some sort of suit-wearing office drone who thought he was above all of us rural folks. We were going one apartment at a time, working as a team, to clear the threat. Chuck decided we were going too slow. He paused to horror laugh, looking at the ceiling like we had anything else to do. Not like we were late for happy hour, he grimaced. Anyway, he decided to take on a room by himself. As soon as that door opened, four of those things rushed out. He never knew what hit him. Unfortunately, the rest of us did. From then on out, it's just a blur. I grabbed Karen and ran back to our corner apartment, locking it up tight. It took a couple of days for the screaming and cries for help to stop. After that... We knew we were alone. Took us damn near two weeks to clear that place ourselves. We waited till Juan got to the door, cracked it open and stabbed. He shivered, holding Karen tighter. Not something I want to live through again. Although for what it's worth, I did stab that punk Chuck in the face half a dozen times. He wrinkled his nose. That felt good. Copeland nodded in understanding. I have some horror stories myself, he said softly but I think you have enough keeping you up at night as it is. He walked to the window, looking out in the direction of the target, with the area still thick with walking corpses. I hope Bretts and Wade are having better luck than we are. Chapter 2 Bretts and Wade raced through the house, checking every window and opening, looking for a clear path out so they could pursue Ted Harris. They had handguns at the ready, Bretts with an assault rifle on his shoulder, 
and Wade with the night vision hunting rifle on his. As they moved, gunshots echoed throughout the surrounding houses. You got anything? the corporal called. Wade stared out a window, watching as a gunman a few houses down emptied a magazine into several zombies rushing towards him. A couple of creatures dropped to the ground, but there were way too many for him. Wade shook his head and walked away from the window as the corpses had their feast. Nothing good, he said. Runners? Bretts asked. Three, four of them, about to make another one, Wade said dryly. The corporal walked from the back door to the front room, joining Wade, who emerged from a side room. Brett shook his head as well, eyes downcast. Guessing the back door isn't an option either? Wade asked. Crowded outside, going back as far as I can see, the corporal replied. Can't tell who are runners and who are shamblers, but we have to assume it's a lot of them. Guess we're going out the front door then, Wade muttered. They walked to the front window, and as soon as Brett's peeked out, his eyes widened. Down! he screamed. Both men hit the deck as gunfire ripped through the front of the house, shattering glass and splintering wood. They crawled away, Wade towards the side room and Brett's towards the back. How many? the sniper called. I saw three at the street, Brett's called. But who the fuck knows? Wade pulled himself into a bedroom as bullets continued to fly. He barely had time to compose himself when the window behind him shattered violently, and he spun around, still on the floor, spotting a runner trying to crawl inside. Oh no, you don't, he muttered, and took aim with his handgun, firing a few times to put it down. Wade! Bretts yelled from the other room. Just a runner wanting to get in, the sniper called back. Gunshots continued to crash through the front of the house before abruptly stopping. More continued outside, but they were at least no longer coming into their house. Guess they drew some company, the corporal said. Let's help them out, then, Wade replied, and the soldiers both popped up from the floor, rushing towards the front of the house with their weapons at the ready. Wade looked through the now open window. The blinds shot clean off and spotted one of the chosen firing off into the distance. He slid along the ground, stopping in a crouched position and aiming, firing a single round into the side of the man's leg. The chosen lackey let out a terrified, pain-filled scream as he dropped to the ground. The soldiers ducked as retaliatory fire came back through the house, but that was short-lived as the men outside were forced to combat the zombie threat headed their way. Wade popped up to the side of the window, preparing another shot, and watched as one of the still-standing men fired to protect their injured friend. It was valiant, but ultimately in vain, as a couple of runners dove on top of him, sinking their teeth into his screaming form. Wade started to aim, but was forced to duck down as the three remaining men outside fired towards him, running towards the house. Both soldiers fired a few times, blind shooting as they retreated towards the back of the house. As they ran through the living room, violent thrashing echoed from the side rooms as runners started to pull themselves inside. Wade darted towards a door and pulled it shut, barely trapping a ghoul inside. They didn't get to the other door in time, and a runner emerged from inside, pausing ever so briefly to hone in on a target. The ghoul locked on to Brett's and started to run, and Wade lowered his shoulder, tackling the beast and driving it into the wall and pinning it there. He quickly raised his handgun and shot it several times in the side of the head before Brett's reached over and grabbed him by the shirt, dragging him into the kitchen. Thanks, the corporal said. Don't mention it, Wade quipped. The front door shook beneath a boot, and cracks began to form as someone kicked it from the outside. You got a plan? Wade asked. Bretts took a deep breath. Light him up and run like hell out the back? He asked. There was another kick to the front door, and the duo stayed behind cover, forced to, as a few bullets flew in through the front window. With a tactical mind like that, I can see why you got promoted, Wade drawled. Bretts rolled his eyes, and they prepared for the attack. The next kick nearly dislodged the door, and they knew it would fall with the next one. The corporal motioned for Wade to check the back door, and the sniper rushed over, seeing a couple dozen slow-moving zombies shuffling their way, spread out over several yards. No runners. We can move, Wade hissed. On my mark, Brett said. Wade nodded, assuming his position, and they readied their handguns, keeping an eye on the door and the creatures inside. Bretz awaited the final kick on the front door, but out of the corner of his eye, 
he noticed the side interior door was beginning to buckle under the pressure from the bedroom. It was a cheaper quality wooden door, and it wouldn't take much to crack. This should be fun, Brett's quipped, and holstered his handgun in favor of his assault rifle, waiting for the final kick to the front door. A moment later the Chosen broke in, and the corporal ignored them, unleashing several three-round bursts towards the bedroom. His aim was true, hitting the hinge side of the door and weakening it enough that the ghouls could bust through. The Chosen ducked as they came in, taking cover, before realizing they weren't being shot at, and moving quickly through the living room. Screams echoed as they were caught off guard by the unleashed zombies. Now! Bretts cried and sprung up, shooting blindly towards the living room as Wade threw open the back door. The corporal glanced back as they exited, but the Chosen were completely focused on defending themselves from a surge of creatures, and not paying any attention to the fleeing soldiers. Wade was first outside, running towards the closest zombie and giving it a forceful front kick in the chest, sending it to the ground, leaving a ten-yard buffer around them. Brett's caught up, pointing towards the corner where they'd come into the town. It's five or six blocks that way, he said. Hug the houses, stay in the shadows, let's move. Wade nodded, and the two of them ran towards the target. The gunshots coming from Ted's house behind them intensified, with one of the gunmen getting to the back door and firing wildly in their direction. The shots caused the soldiers to take cover behind some large trees a couple of houses up, and Wade pulled out his sniper rifle looking through the night vision scope towards the house. A man stood in the doorway with a walkie-talkie against his mouth. Wade didn't hesitate, pulling the trigger and punching around through the man's chest. Night vision coming in handy, I see, Bretts murmured. Wade shook his head and slung the rifle over his shoulder. Just waited too long to use it, he said. Pretty sure he just called us in. The joys of being popular, Bretts quipped. Before the soldiers could get moving, a shot came at them from a house across the street. The duo fired back towards it, hitting nothing that they could see but the volley stopped for the time being. Bretts looked around and motioned towards the back of the next house. Get to cover, he said. Wade moved first, running towards the back of the house. As he came around the corner, he darted around a shambler and grabbed it by the shirt, slinging it to the ground. Bretts drew his knife and jammed it into the side of the zombie's head. We're going to have a hell of a time getting to Ted if we're being hunted, Wade said as Bretts cleaned his knife. Ideas? the corporal asked. Wade shrugged. I got jack shit, he quipped. Great, Brett said with a sigh. He looked around back towards Ted's house, seeing some movement in the shadows that was too quick and coordinated to be zombies. We have some on our tail, and God knows how many ahead of us, he mused. The corporal thought for a moment, before jogging down to the other side of the house, looking back towards the street. He spotted several zombies in the road, none of which were moving too fast towards the house across the street drawn to the noise. Wade clenched and unclenched his jaw as he watched the gears turning in his partner's head. This is going to be a shit show, isn't it? He drawled. Yep, Brett confirmed. Only question is, how big of one? Guess it's my fault for not coming up with an idea of my own, Wade said with a sigh. The corporal smirked. Taking responsibility, I like it, he joked. So, what are we doing? The sniper asked. We are going to use them for cover, Brett said, pointing to the zombies in the street. Wade took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Not going to provide much cover, he said, shaking his head. And not exactly a long-term solution. Brett grinned and wiggled his handgun in the air. That's why we're going to keep making noise, he said, drawing them towards us to create a buffer. Oh, good, Wade said, sarcasm evident. For a second there, I thought you were suggesting we do something crazy. We get across the street over another block and fire a few times, Brett continued, motioning as he spoke. Keep the zombies headed our way. Those chosen assholes will know where we are, but they'll have to fight to get to us. Wade sighed. Fuck it, I'm in, he said. Lead the way. The corporal nodded and checked the ammo on his handgun. The magazine was about half full and he smacked it back in. He led them out, running hard across the yard and towards the road, trying to get behind the small mob of ghouls to put a buffer between them. As they emerged from the side of the house, shots went off from the house across the street and from the initial gunmen pursuing them. All of the shots missed, and Brett squeezed off a couple of rounds once they got to the road, 
firing upwards as it was easier than trying a one-in-a-million shot towards the enemy. The two of them raced across the street, heading for some trees for cover, with Bretts firing off another shot. They paused for a moment as return fire whizzed by them. Wade looked back towards the road at the pack headed towards them. Bretts looked towards the house in front of them and spotted several zombies emerging from the sides, luckily all shamblers. We fighting through? Wade asked. Move up the street to the next house, Bretts barked. Go! The two of them broke from cover, shots coming from behind them, but none of them getting through as the wall of rotting flesh did a great job of protecting them. When they reached the next house, several more zombies came from around the sides, bringing the total to about forty in their general area. They kept running in the yards, moving up another house, but then a pack of ghouls tore around the next house. The lead zombie looked fresh, with bright red blood on its shirt. As soon as it spotted the two men rushing in its direction, it let out an excited screech and sprinted towards them. Runner! Wade cried. When it passes us, get into the house! Bretts yelled, and his companion nodded, waiting for the corporal to make his move. The runner moved at a dead sprint, and at the last second Bretts stutter-stepped, darting to one side and planting his leg into the ground to deliver a forceful shoulder base into the ghoul's side. The runner flew clear off its feet, flying through the air and slamming hard onto the ground. Now! Bretts barked, and Wade darted to the front of the house, using the brief moment they had to its fullest. He tried the knob, but it was locked, so he immediately fired a few rounds into the mechanism, freeing the door from the frame. The duo rushed inside, not bothering to secure the door behind them, as zombies continued to pursue. Back door, and get to the next block! Bretts bellowed behind him, and Wade ran through the living room and into the kitchen to the back sliding glass door. As he approached it, the glass shattered from a bullet coming from the outside, causing both him and Bretts to duck for cover. These fuckers are everywhere! Wade hissed. The corporal looked back towards the front door where several shamblers were in the doorway pressed against one another and becoming wedged in. Past them, the runner shrieked and thrashed, pushing hard to get in. It wouldn't be long before it succeeded in doing just that. Down the hall! Move! Brett sparked, and they stayed low, avoiding flying bullets and rushing towards the master bedroom at the end. They burst inside as the zombies made their way into the house, and Brett slammed the door shut behind them as Wade rushed to the window. We clear? the corporal asked. The sniper shook his head. Gonna be in a fight, he warned. Let's get to it then, Bretts quipped, and moved across the bedroom with purpose. He grabbed a small chair and spun around, whipping it through the window and shattering it. The chair flew into the yard, slamming into a zombie and knocking it to the ground. Wade leapt out first, landing and immediately shooting a zombie in the face before shoving a couple of others back as Bretts jumped down behind him. They moved quickly towards the back of the house, looking in the direction of the gunfire. The nearby zombies were slow-moving and about ten yards away, giving them mere seconds to figure out a plan. We cannot do this for three more blocks, Wade grunted. Bretts nodded. Agreed, he said, and took a deep breath. No more firing, he said, and pointed to the house at the next corner. Move quick to that house, get inside and lay low, we gotta take them out first, though. No followers. Works for me, Wade agreed and they put away their guns, replacing them with blades. The duo made quick work of the remaining zombies, leaving them alone. They darted out, but tried to stick to the shadows as much as they could. Luckily, no other bullets came their way as they made it across yards to the next block. They glanced back towards the house they'd just come from, and the zombies were still all over it, making it look like they were still inside. The soldiers cautiously made their way up to the corner house, peeking inside and seeing no movement human or otherwise. Bretts kept watch as Wade used his knife to unlatch the patio door. They snuck inside, gently closing the glass door behind them, before sweeping the house. Clear, the corporal called quietly. Clear, Wade replied, and headed for the front as Bretts stayed at the back to keep watch. The sniper gazed in the direction of the target, watching a mobile hit squad of four heavily armed men run towards their position. He gripped his handgun tightly preparing for a fight before the men ran right by them, headed towards the zombie house where they'd been before. Wade let out a sigh of relief and clicked his tongue to get the corporal's attention. Bretts joined him in the front, approaching the window. We've bought ourselves a minute or two, but I wouldn't recommend staying here any longer than that, Wade said quietly. 
The corporal nodded. Agreed, he said. The duo relaxed for that minute or two, catching their breath, amazed at having made it through the first leg of the chaos. Chapter 3 The lights were all but off in the armory, with the exception of the small camping lantern in the living room that they turned down to the lowest setting. Copeland stood by the back window, looking out towards the direction of the civilian prison house. Zombies roamed around, although it had been several minutes since he'd seen a runner. Gunshots popped off in the distance occasionally, with heavy concentration of fire in the distance. Those two boys must be getting in all kinds of trouble over there, Copeland murmured to himself. Dennis approached from the front of the house. Karen's keeping watch on the front. There's nothing out there except for a stray zombie here or there, he said. The noise is drawing them to the far side of town. Looks like this is going to be as good a time as any to get moving, Copeland said and pointed to the camping light. Get that to the front and out of sight while I slip out. You got your radio? Dennis held it up, showing it off with his shoulders squared. Good. You keep that thing on, but low volume, the sergeant instructed. Channel 6. When I call, you and Karen be ready to move, because we're going to be hauling ass out of here. You got it? Yes, sir, Dennis said. We'll be ready. If there's any trouble, you lock yourselves in that bedroom and hold tight till I get back, Copeland said firmly and raised a finger. Whatever you do, however, do not under any circumstances call me. Is that understood? Dennis nodded slowly, eyes wide. Good, Copeland said, because I'm starting to like you, and I'd feel real bad about having to whoop your ass for endangering my life. Dennis gulped nervously. The sergeant nodded, happy that his point had gotten across. All right, let's get this show on the road, he said, and smacked the man on the shoulder. He moved to the door, grabbing the assault rifle from the counter and slinging it over his shoulder. He checked his two handguns as well as his combat vest that held various magazines. You look like you're about to invade a small island nation, Dennis joked. Copeland shrugged. Don't know what I'm going to run into at the prison house, he replied. Want to be prepared for anything. They're not going to know what hit them, Dennis said. Copeland pulled out a giant hunting knife from his hip holster. Nope, they sure as hell aren't, he said, and looked outside to do one last check of the immediate area, and then gave Dennis a nod. He opened the door just enough for Copeland to dart outside, knife in hand, ready to strike. The door shut softly behind him, and the sergeant looked around, standing in the shadows against the wall. Luckily, the nearby zombies didn't catch wind of him coming out, and nothing was in pursuit just yet. He scanned the area, checking another house across the yard with only a couple of zombies in his path, concealed in the shade of a tree. He broke position, moving swiftly but quietly towards them, staying in the shadows. He got to the first one, jamming his blade into the base of its skull, dropping it to the ground. Before the other one could let out a moan of excitement, Copeland stabbed it in the bridge of the nose, burying the blade six inches deep. The sergeant grabbed the beast by the shirt and gently set it to the ground so he wouldn't make any unnecessary noise. He pulled his knife out and moved up to the back of the next house. Copeland moved to the other side of the building, peeking inside the windows to make sure there weren't any enemies hiding inside, dead or otherwise, but it was clear. He repeated this process before taking up position at the edge of the house on the corner of the street. His target was at least three more blocks up, and a couple over, so he still had a ways to go. The path to the next block diagonal to him was wide open, even though there was a bit of light coming from solar lights lining the road. It's a risk, but so is taking my sweet time while exposed out here, he thought, and contemplated for a moment before shaking his head. Fuck it. He broke from cover, running as hard as he could across the grass stopping just at the road to speed walk across so that he could control the volume level. Even with the deliberate footsteps and trying to stay as quiet as possible, he still made enough noise that a chorus of moans reacted from up the block. He picked up the pace, reaching the grass and ducking behind a wooden fence. He peeked over at a sizable pack of ghouls heading his way, maybe twenty strong, with more that could be concealed by shadows. He ignored them, staying low against the fence and moving to the house close by. When he grew closer, the blinds moved and he picked up the pace, barely hitting the wall before the blinds opened. Copeland was at an extreme angle, 
able to see someone looking out, but he himself was difficult to see given the darkness. He let out a soft sigh of relief as no bullets flew towards him. With that danger past, he continued on his way, moving cautiously towards the back of the house. Rather than take the chance of being spotted while trying to cross the backyard, he hopped the wooden fence at the side of the house and continued on to the next block. Knowing that the target house was along the back wall of the neighborhood, Copeland moved in that direction. Yard after yard he hopped fences, avoiding the light at all costs. It was all pretty routine for someone of the sergeant's skill level, but even so, he didn't let himself get cocky. Cocky would lead to sloppiness. Sloppiness would lead to getting eaten. After a couple of blocks of nothingness, Copeland found himself on the back street of the community, with only a house in front of him before the road. He hid behind a large tree in the backyard of a house, looking for his target. He spotted it almost directly across the street from where he was. It was an older-looking house, single-story, with no trees in the yard. There were several solar lights lining the front of the house, which had attracted some ghouls that had gathered out front. It also did a nice job of showing off one of the features of the house, a large metal gutter drainage pipe that ran along the corners. Gotta love these old houses, he thought, but before he could make his move, a sliver of light came from the house directly in front of him. He focused on it, making out the outline of somebody holding a rifle. The image was fleeting, however, and he heard a muffled yell before the light disappeared. Well, shit, he thought. Looks like I have some people to kill first. He contemplated for a moment, knowing that he'd have to be silent or else things could go sideways. If they were chosen inside the hostage house, they would execute everyone if they caught a whiff of trouble. As he thought of potential options, a lone zombie shuffled and moaned nearby. Copeland glanced over and spotted a large male zombie that was missing chunks of flesh all over its torso, struggling to free itself from a large branch on the ground. Oh... This is a bad idea, Copeland thought, and readied his knife, moving over to the zombie who finally broke free once he spotted his prey. He waited until the creature got close before ducking around it and grabbing the back of its shirt collar. The beast thrashed wildly, but Copeland was stronger, managing to force it in the direction of the occupied house. It took a little bit of wrangling, but he finally got it to the building. The ghoul thrashed about, smacking into the side of the house before he was able to get it over the side bedroom window. He pressed it up against the glass, hands smacking against it. He gripped the zombie tightly with one hand, his knife in the other, and waited. A few moments later the curtains pulled back, and light spilled out over the area. Copeland didn't look up, not wanting to be spotted before he was ready to be spotted. A moment later the window slid open. You picked the wrong house, Bobber, a man said. But before he could pull the trigger, Copeland shoved the zombie aside and snatched the man's arm. He pulled him forward while stabbing upwards with his blade, catching him in the throat. The man immediately went limp, blood pouring out over the sergeant's hand. He glanced down at the zombie that was starting to recover, and some indiscriminate yelling erupted from inside the house, no doubt trying to get an update on the situation. Copeland quickly jabbed the dead man's temple with the tip of the blade to make sure he wouldn't reanimate, and then pulled him down on top of the zombie, allowing the ghoul to feast without the threat of a runner being born out of it. Copeland hopped into the window, rushing over to the doorway of the bedroom. More yelling echoed in the hallway before footsteps thundered closer, and the knob turned and the door opened. "'It better not be!' The man never got to finish his sentence as Copeland grabbed him from behind and slit his throat. He stood there, holding the man's mouth tightly as he thrashed about helplessly, bleeding out. A few agonizing moments later, he went limp. Copeland pulled out his handgun, knowing that the house would muffle the shot, and thanks to the other man going to shoot the zombie, it wouldn't cause any danger for the hostages. The sergeant worked his way down the hall towards the living room, which was bathed in light. What the hell took you boys so long? Someone asked from inside. All this commotion is causing me some issues. Copeland popped out from around the corner, aiming at a large man sitting in a recliner. He wore overalls, looked a bit older in his fifties, maybe, with graying hair and a beard. A shotgun sat on a small table beside him, but he was more engaged with the nudie magazine in his lap than anything else. 
The sergeant stood there with his gun aimed as the man continued to stare at what was most likely a long dead model. I said, what the hell took? The man's voice choked off when he raised his gaze to Copeland and dropped the magazine into his lap with a sigh. Well, ain't you a cold fucking shower? Lest we get off on the wrong foot and risk something tragic happening, let me be very clear, Copeland said firmly. If you reach for your weapon, either of them, he motioned to the man's crotch, then I'm going to use my trusty sidearm here to blow it off. Do we understand each other? Oh, we're understanding each other pretty well there, boss, the chosen member replied. So, what do you want? Those people across the street, the ones you were holding hostage, Copeland began. Now hang on a dang minute, the man drawled. I ain't holding anybody hostage. Hell, I only wanted to hold one thing tonight and you interrupted that. Copeland pursed his lips. Be that as it may, you got guns, so I'm assuming you're with the Chosen, he asked. Those other two boys were, you know, the ones I'm assuming you sent to their maker, the man replied. Copeland cocked his head suspiciously. So you're saying you're not with them? he asked dryly. Hell no, the man quipped. I got a farm on the west side of town. Some of these assholes found me a couple days after shit went sideways and decided I was essential to their future plans. Why's that? Copeland asked, brow furrowing. The man shrugged. Hell if I know, he said. Although it might have something to do with saying I knew my land better than any of them, and if they wanted to eat, they'd better keep my crusty ass safe. Solid enough bluff, assuming it was one, the sergeant commended, though his gun never wavered. Shit, man, ain't you never farmed? The man drawled. Land is land, not like mine's magical or nothing. Copeland sighed. All right, I'm inclined to believe you, he said slowly. Killed enough men in my time that I'll gladly embrace a reason not to. That's good to hear, the man replied with a nod. Ain't gonna do much for my underpants at this point, but at least it ain't gonna get worse. Copeland inclined his head towards the street. Now, what do you know about the house across from us? he asked. Not much, to be honest, the man admitted, shaking his head. Pretty sure they keep a few people in there to keep them folks in line, but outside of that, I got nothing. They in there now? Copeland asked. The man shrugged. Most likely, he said. As soon as that gate went, these boys came rushing here wanting in. They came from across the street, so I'm guessing they didn't want to let them in over there. Copeland clucked his tongue. Self-preservative assholes, he muttered. I like killing them, he contemplated for a moment. Not meaning to interrupt your train of thought there, boss, but how are we going to resolve our little standoff? The man asked, pointing between them a few times. The sergeant kept his handgun trained on him as he walked over and grabbed the shotgun from the table. You got a bedroom in this place? he asked, motioning for the man to lower his hands. Yep, room right behind you, he said. Copeland inclined his head. Go there, now, he instructed. The large farmer struggled to get up from his chair before scurrying to the door, keeping his hands visible at all times, clutching his magazine. Copeland stood at the door as he entered the room. Okay? I'm going to shut this door, he said firmly. If it opens while I'm still in this house, I'm going to put multiple bullets in you, some of which are going to be in delicate places. Clear? Crystal, the man replied, nodding emphatically. Good, Copeland replied. Now, I want you to pack up whatever items you can't live without and be ready. My friends and I are getting out of here with those hostages across the street. If you can do what I say when I say it, you can come with us. The man continued to nod like a bobblehead. You just tell me what to do, Hoss, he said. Good man, the sergeant commended and motioned to the back. Once you hear the back door shut, you can come out of your room. When you see my friends pull up, you move like your life depends on it and get on board. If you try anything, my friends will shoot you. The farmer waved him off. Yeah, yeah, I get it. If I'm stupid, I die, he drawled. Well, if I'm stupider than normal, I die. Copeland cracked a small smile. All right, time to go to work, he said, and closed the door. He breathed a sigh of relief at having dodged a bullet, but also saved a life he didn't need to take. The sergeant worked his way to the front of the house, looking out across the street. There were zombies all in the front of the house, but the sides were pretty open. A chain-link fence ran along the left side, but the light from the front faded before he could see too far into the yard. There was no movement he could detect, however. Okay, that's the entry point, he thought. Hope there's one of those pipes on the backside. I can climb up and get in from the top. 
He bounced on the balls of his feet to psych himself up. I got this. He checked his handguns before checking his assault rifle. The safeties were off, and he was ready to cause some trouble. The sergeant made his way to the back of the house, sneaking outside without detection. He paused when he heard the large decoy zombie munching on the feast he'd provided for it. Copeland moved the opposite way, heading a couple of houses over to make sure he wasn't spotted while crossing the road. When he reached the edge of a house, he looked down the street both ways. The only zombies he could see were in front of the house. Presumably the others in the area had all headed towards Brett's and Wade, as if on cue gunshots popped off in their direction, causing him to shake his head at all the hubbub. He made it across the street and round to the back of the houses, working his way back towards his target. He hopped the chain-link fence and ran to the edge of the house, staying in the shadows. Dozens of zombies milled about in front of the house, with a few pouring around the sides. There were only a small handful in the backyard, though, making his job a lot easier. A large metal drainage pipe on the corner closest to him provided a clear path up to the roof. The closest ghoul was about five yards away so he would have to be quick. Copeland took a deep breath, steadying himself before taking off. He rushed to the fence, hopping it in a single bound. The noise of the fence rattling attracted the nearby zombie, which came his way. He met it at the pipe, not bothering to kill it, instead kicking it back to the ground. With a few precious seconds before any others got to him, Copeland began to climb, holding onto the pipe tightly and walking the wall up to the roof. As he did this, the ghouls below began to converge on his position. Once he safely reached the roof, he looked down and the half-dozen zombies reaching up from the grass. The backyard was momentarily illuminated through the bars on the windows, someone inside apparently looking out. Copeland readied his weapon just in case, but nobody came out. Well, I'm up here, now what? He took a deep breath with the thought and looked around, finding an access panel to the attic with a fan attached to it. He stood over it for a moment, looking for a place to pry it open. It didn't take him long to get it off, and he tossed it off into the backyard. The noise at that point wouldn't matter, as the men inside likely knew something was on the roof from his footfalls. He got into the attic, quickly locating the door leading into the house. Rather than walk towards it, he took a soft step to the side, finding some cover against a beam. "'Whoever you are, you fucked up by coming here!' someone called from below. Copeland didn't respond, didn't move, just pulled out his assault rifle and aimed it towards the attic door. "'Hope you're comfortable, because this is where you're gonna die!' the man continued. Copeland couldn't help but internally roll his eyes at the speech. He continued to aim, not wavering in the slightest and then nearly snickering at the murmuring and arguing from below. For all their bravado, these guys didn't actually want to deal with any threats themselves. After several moments, the attic door slowly opened and a light shone inside. A timid, terrified-looking man with a rifle slowly climbed up, holding a flashlight in his offhand, struggling to aim while holding both. At first he aimed at the opposite direction that Copeland was in, and then scanned around slowly. Copeland waited until the man aimed towards the side of the house before firing. A single round tore through the side of his enemy's head, splattering blood on the dust-covered plywood floor. Immediately afterward, panic fire came up through the floor, nowhere close to where the sergeant was. After several moments of this, Copeland made his move, running across the rafters to limit his noise. When he was close enough, he dove headfirst towards the opening, his assault rifle stretched out. The force of his dive carried him over the threshold of the opening, allowing him to bend over the edge at stomach level and open fire. He quickly found his targets, two men towards the end of the hallway. His three round bursts ripped the lead man to shreds, and the last remaining chosen dove into the living room. Copeland continued to aim as the man came out with a young woman in a headlock, using her as a human shield. She was easily in her twenties, with shoulder length brown hair and waif thin. These people for sure hadn't been treated well during their slave time in Nampa. Drop your gun, or I'm gonna kill this bitch! The man screamed, aiming his gun at the sergeant. The only thing Copeland did was switch his gun to single-shot mode, but the click made his opponent visibly flinch. I swear to God, I'll do it! 
the man warned. Copeland continued to aim down his sights, not breaking away, but for the time being ignored the man and spoke directly to the woman. "'What's your name, girl?' he asked. "'Claudia,' she replied, her voice surprisingly steady. "'Okay, Claudia,' Copeland replied gently. "'Do you trust me?' She looked up at him and winked. "'Nope,' she quipped. "'However, I hope you're as good as you appear to be.' Before anything else, she lunged to the side, pinning the Chosen's arm between her head and shoulder, shoving his gun to the side, and providing just enough room for the sergeant to squeeze off a single round. The bullet hit the Chosen man in the chest, causing him to drop his gun and fall to the floor without even a single panic shot. Claudia picked up the gun, aiming it at the man who wheezed for breath, his mouth opening and closing in a plea for mercy. Don't shoot, Copeland said as he dropped to the carpet gracefully. He deserves to die, she replied. I understand that, the sergeant agreed, and he will, but I have a few questions for him first. Claudia hesitated, and then fired into the wall next to the chosen man's head, causing him to shriek, and a wet spot to grow in the front of his jeans. She smirked. Okay, everybody, we're safe, she called. Copeland approached her as she shoved the handgun into the waistband of her stained pants. Some good shooting there, she commended. Pretty nice move on your part, Copeland replied, and inclined his head towards the gun. Looks like you know how to handle that pretty well. She nodded. Growing up in these parts trained me pretty well, she replied. A couple years in the National Guard didn't hurt either. Someone with some training. I can work with that, Copeland replied, appraising her with a nod. I'm Sergeant Copeland. She cocked a brow. Still going by rank, huh? She drawled. Guessing that means the military is still around, or are you just showing off? He smirked. Military is still around, ma'am, he said. As a matter of fact, a couple more are causing some trouble on the other side of town as we speak. Good, Claudia said darkly. These guys deserve everything they're getting. Copeland looked around as a dozen more people started coming out of hiding in the rooms on either side of the hallway. How many of you are there? the sergeant asked. Seventeen in this house, Claudia replied. Don't know how many there are in the other house by the gate. It's bigger, though. Copeland nodded. Don't worry, we're getting them out, too, he promised. He pulled out his walkie-talkie, giving it a few clicks on the receiver to send a low-noise message. A few seconds later, Brett strolled. Beginning to wonder if you were slacking off over there, Sergeant. Not when there's asses to be kicked, Corporal, Copeland replied. What's your status? We're a couple blocks from the escape point, Brett's replied. Got bogged down with Chosen and Zombies, and more of both. Understood, the sergeant said with a nod. Priority is still Ted Harris. Evacuation immediately after. How many you got over there? Bretts asked. Copeland tilted his head. Eighteen, including myself, he replied. No, wait, nineteen. Got a potential friendly across the street. Potential friendly? Bretts asked dryly. Claims to be a farmer, Copeland explained. Seemed to be genuine. Claudia raised her hand, waving to get the sergeant's attention. Hang on, Copeland said into the communicator, and then turned to her. Yes? She held out her hand at the farmer's height. Older guy? she asked. Not exactly in peak physical conditions? That's the one, Copeland said with a nod. Yeah, he's a farmer, she said, lowering her hand. Used to come into the hardware store I worked at before all this. So he's not one of the chosen? the sergeant asked, raising an eyebrow. Hell no, Claudia replied with a chuckle. They wouldn't let his country bumpkin ass join them unless they had a specific use for him. Kind of like everyone in this house. Copeland looked around at all the people around him, all wide eyes and dirty clothes. He nodded before resuming his conversation in the communicator. Okay, we have confirmation of the friendly across the street, he said. When he sees you pull up, he's coming your way. Try not to shoot him if you can help it. You got it, Sarge, Bretts replied. We're getting back to it. Call when we're on the way. Take that asshole out, Copeland snarled. Yes, sir, the corporal said firmly. The line went dead, and the sergeant turned to Claudia. I need you to get these people ready to move, he instructed. If there's food, water, take it. They're going to be drawing a crowd when they pull up, so we're going to have to move quick. Trust me, sergeant, none of us want to spend another second in this place. Claudia promised. We'll be ready to move. That's what I like to hear, he said with a smile. Give me two of them to help keep watch and do your thing. She nodded, 
pointing at two men close by and motioning towards opposite sides of the house. Okay, people, you heard the man, she barked. Let's get ready to get the hell out of here. While Claudia got everyone ready, Copeland looked down at the wounded man who still sat there wheezing. The sergeant knelt down and patted him on the boots playfully. I'm going to make you a deal, he drawled. You do what I ask, and you never have to see her again. You don't, well, I can't be responsible for what she does. You good with that? The wounded man eyed Claudia, eyes wide with fear, and she smirked, fainting left towards him. He flinched away from her, and when she laughed at his plight, he turned back to Copeland, nodding furiously. Good boy, the sergeant cooed. You get comfy, because we have stuff to talk about. Chapter 4 Bretz put down the walkie-talkie after his chat with Copeland, walking over to Wade, who kept watch in the direction they'd come from. "'How are we looking?' the corporal asked. Wade shrugged. "'Few stragglers who apparently can't hear too well,' he said. "'Every time a shot goes off, they look around, but can't seem to figure out where it's coming from.' "'No chosen?' Bretz asked. Wade shook his head. "'Nope,' he replied, popping the pee. Maybe they wrote us off. And maybe a couple of porn stars are waiting for me back in my bunk, Brett strolled, and both soldiers chuckled at the thought. So, what's the plan? Wade asked with a sigh. The corporal shrugged. If we see Ted, we shoot him, he replied. That's about all I got. Wade inspected his hunting rifle, spotting four more rounds in the magazine. Don't suppose you picked up a few extra rounds for me? he asked. Bretz nodded and reached into one of the pockets of his tactical pants, pulling out two more mags with five shots each. They were short on magazines, but figured you'd want semi-auto rather than bolt action, he explained. Normally I wouldn't, Wade admitted, but since it's two of us versus the world, being able to mow them down is a plus. Come on, Bretz, once they were set. Should only be a couple more blocks. They got up, readying their knives for close encounters. They exited through the back door under cover of darkness, moving swiftly through the yards towards the main road at the back of the compound. Once the soldiers made it there, they worked their way to the corner, three blocks up. After the first block they could see a bit better what was happening at the fence. About thirty people, mostly armed chosen guards but a few civilians, stood around several dead bodies on the ground, with a few more zombies shambling towards them. The duo watched as a couple of guards slung their rifles over their shoulders, grabbed baseball bats, and walked out to swing for the fences. The ghouls dropped to the ground, and the guards walked back to their post. "'Guess they don't want to attract attention,' Wade said quietly. "'Would be a shame if that happened, wouldn't it?' "'I like the way you think,' Brett said, wagging a finger at him, and then looked around at their exposed position. "'But not until we have some proper cover.' They moved around the back, running up the rest of the block, stopping at a corner house. Wade kept watch with his night-vision scope as Bretts got the back patio door open. It clicked, and he slid it aside, and the two of them slipped in. After a quick sweep turning up nothing, they began to prepare their attack. There were three windows at the front of the living room, giving them a perfect angle towards the escape. Wade set up on the ground at the right corner as Bretts cracked open a window to give him a clear shot. Tell me what you see, Brett said as Wade scanned the area. The sniper lowered his rifle, shaking his head. What's wrong? the corporal asked, brow furrowing. Our boy's long gone, Wade said, crestfallen. They got families up there now. Brett shrugged. Maybe he's a gentleman, you know, women and children first, he suggested, though he was only half serious. I talked to the man, Wade scoffed. Got the impression he would feed his firstborn to one of those things if it would save his own skin. Brett's shoulders slumped. Yeah, he's long gone, he muttered. Doesn't mean we can't light these fuckers up once they're clear, though, the sniper quipped. I like the way you think, Brett said slowly. But we're outnumbered, what, fifteen, twenty to two? Wade smirked. True, but we have the drop on them, he said. I hit a couple of them at the top of the post. They're going to pour back down. They aren't military, so someone is going to start panic shooting. Then we just wait for our rotting friends to even the odds. Bretz took a deep breath as he contemplated, still on the fence about starting another massive firefight. I see that look in your eye, Wade said. The corporal sighed. It's there for a reason, he replied. 
These people have killed our friends, Wade insisted. Killed innocent people. So have half the people we've met this month, Brett's countered dryly. They're also going to go and regroup, Wade continued, pointing a finger at him. Get into a fortified position and have to be dug out like a radioactive tick. We take them out now and that's less work we have to do later. Brett's took a deep breath and finally nodded, but hesitated briefly. Radioactive tick? he asked. Wade shrugged. I don't know, he admitted. Like those old monster movies, everything was radioactive and got bigger, stronger. You get my point. Brett's laughed. Yeah, I'm tracking, he said. Okay, I'm going to set up in the bedroom, give them two targets to shoot at. I wait on your shot. And once they start shooting back, Wade asked. Brett shrugged. We do what we've done all day, he replied. Bob and Weave, run like hell to cover, repeat as necessary. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? The sniper suggested. Damn straight, the corporal agreed. Now, as soon as that last civilian is over the wall, you light him up. Yes, sir, Wade said and readied his rifle. He looked through the scope, concentrating his attention at the top of the scaffolding. There were two families up top, each with small children being lowered down the other side. He moved and aimed at a large burly man on the right, a hunting rifle slung over his shoulder. Look at the bright side, Bubba. The last thing you do in this life will probably be a positive one, Wade murmured as he kept the crosshairs on the man's head. Probably won't save you when you get to the other side, though. The mood was tense, the hurry-up-and-wait mode. As a sniper, Wade was used to this. However, over the last month of non-stop battles, he was eager to just throw down. Minutes went by before the last family loaded up and lowered down. As soon as they vanished on the other side of the wall, the sniper counted down to himself. Ten seconds should get them low enough, he thought, and began counting in his head. Anticipation built as he grew closer to zero. Three, two, one. He took a beat after one, and then squeezed the trigger. The bullet ripped through the burly man's head, the force of the blast sending him tumbling over the edge of the wall. He quickly found his next target, a smaller man who was a few yards away from his initial target. The man was panicked, clearly unsure of what had just happened. He fumbled for his rifle, but before he could even get it off of his shoulder, a round punched into his gut. It was a cruel way to die, especially with no medical professionals around, but Wade needed him to make a lot of noise. The man was in agony, and several others on the makeshift walkways fired blindly into the night, unable to locate the sniper. Wade searched for his next victim, a young man abandoning his post and running up to the top of the wall. Wade fired, missing the man when he slipped while running. The sniper took a careful aim and pulled the trigger, this time whipping the wounded man right around, sending his body flipping from the walkway and down to the ground below. Wade popped out the magazine to load in another one, and bullets peppered the windows. Shit! They spotted us! he cried, and took cover as everyone honed in on the house, sending dozens of rounds ripping through the front. After several seconds of this, Brett's opened fire in three round bursts from the bedroom, giving Wade the opening to crawl towards the back of the house, staying low. When he reached the kitchen to regroup, there was the faint outline of someone running towards them. He readied his handgun, waiting for them to get to the glass. The armed man tried to open the patio door, but Wade started firing, shattering the glass and putting the man down. A second later, several bullets came from the darkness of the backyard. Brett's, we gotta move, Wade bellowed. They're flanking us! He scrambled to his feet, staying low to avoid the gunfire while sending a few rounds out the back. Brett's came out of the front bedroom, firing a few shots as they converged, and worked their way down the hallway. When they reached the back bedroom on the side of the house, Wade busted in and immediately went for the window as the corporal laid down suppressing fire at the men coming in through the back. Wade didn't bother to look at what was outside as it couldn't be any worse than what was coming for them inside. He hopped down, pressing himself against the wall as bullets continued to fly inside and out. Wade was about to call out for Brett's to join him, but then froze. Half a dozen runners rushed towards them from a couple houses away. He drew his handgun, but he knew it wouldn't be enough to save them. The gunfire from the enemy position intensified, garnering the attention of the ghouls as they raced. Rather than track towards the muffled gunfire from inside the house, 
the zombies headed to the road and tore down towards that. Wade breathed a sigh of relief before popping back in through the window. We're clear! Let's move! he barked. Bretz emptied the rest of his magazine before racing across the bedroom and out the window. He stumbled when he hit the ground, but Wade picked him up, and they tore away from the chaos they'd created. Did you get him? Wade asked. Bretz grunted. Who knows? he muttered, and slammed in a new magazine as the gunfire intensified from the escape route, no doubt in response to the runners. The two soldiers reached the next house, barely ducking behind the back wall as bullets flew their way from where they'd just run from. Clear the back, I got this, Brett said. Wade used his night vision scope to search the darkened area. There was a tone of movement in the distance, moving in and out between the trees and houses. Nothing was moving quickly, however. Just some slow pokes, Wade said. Nobody with a gun, as far as I can tell. The corporal flipped to single-shot mode, aiming at the window where three gunmen emerged. He fired one round, hitting a man in the arm, prompting the other two to open fire, forcing him back behind cover. Thank God for small miracles, Bretz muttered. He turned back towards the pursuers to fire off another round, but they were distracted by a runner that had come back their way. He wanted to fire, but hesitated, knowing the untrained men were easier to deal with than a runner, especially in the dark. He watched as the runner honed in on the wounded man, as if it could sense weakness. The man struggled to hold it back as his two friends tried to line up a shot, and finally one of them dropped to one knee, holding his rifle aiming upwards and fired, nearly taking the head off the ghoul clean off. Once the runner threat was cleared, Bretz aimed and fired a few more rounds, missing the targets but forcing them to dive to the ground for cover. We should get moving, he said. Wade scanned the area, pausing and getting ready to fire. Got something? the corporal asked. Wade tracked a target before squeezing the trigger. He watched through the green-tinted night vision as his bullet narrowly missed the moving target. But it moved even quicker for cover. Damn, missed him, the sniper muttered. He quickly scanned the area around the target, finding four other figures peeking out from behind trees, issuing hand signals to each other. Got four more coming our way, he warned. Next house, get inside, Bretz hissed, and they broke from position, running through the backyard as bullets flew, punching into the brick just inches above their heads. When they reached the next house, Wade pulled out his handgun, firing several shots into the patio glass and crashing through it. As soon as he was in the kitchen, rapid footsteps came his way. He braced for impact as a runner came at him from the living room, an older man with several bite marks and a kill shot opening up his throat. Wade couldn't get his handgun up in time before the beast was on him. All he could manage was to brace himself with his arms, creating a little space between his neck and the snapping jaws of the ghoul. The weight and the force slammed him into the kitchen wall as he struggled to keep from becoming breakfast. Brett's leapt and fired a single rifle round, striking the zombie in the head. Wade shoved the corpse to the floor, shaking off the panic and regaining his composure. You good? the corporal asked. The sniper nodded sharply. Still here, he quipped. A couple of shots ripped through the kitchen, smacking into the walls and forcing the duo into the living room for cover. They ran down a hallway, but a volley of bullets sprayed from that way as well. They flanked us, Bretz cried. Butch and Sundance are in the living room, Wade barked. The soldiers reached the living room taking up position behind a wall separating the kitchen from the main space. Wade aimed down the hallway while Bretz kept his eyes around the corner towards the back door. They braced for a battle, most likely one they'd come out on the losing end of, but they weren't going down without a fight. Strangely, nothing happened for several moments. "'We got you boys now,' somebody finally said from the back porch. Bretz rolled his eyes. You are aware you're not the first person to think that today, aren't you? He drawled back. Hell, you aren't the first person to think that in the last ten minutes. I would say go ask them how that turned out, but you'd need a Ouija board to make contact. No lack of confidence, I'll give you that, the enemy chosen member quipped. Bretz raised his gun. You set one foot inside this house and I'll give you a lot more than that, he warned. I bet you will, the man replied with a chuckle. But look around. We have you surrounded. Why don't you make this easy on all of us and just come on out? We're not going to kill you. 
At least not yet. Mr. Harris is going to want to have a word with you. Brett and Wade shared a look and a nod. So, he did get out, huh? The corporal asked. We protect our leader, the man replied proudly, as he has protected us. Brett let out a loud laugh, making sure it would echo down the hallway. He protects you, huh? He asked. Abandoning ship while you deal with an invading army and runners? Not sure I'd call a couple of soldiers an invading army, the man scoffed. We brought your entire compound to its knees in a matter of minutes, Brett shot back. And that's just with a handful of us. What do you think is going to happen when the rest of us show up? He let that sink in, waiting during the long pause from the outside. Yeah, you're thinking long and hard about that one, aren't you? He drawled. You're way out of your depth here, boy. We're not deer that you can pick off at your leisure while you drink a beer in your hunting stand. We're hardened, battle-tested badasses who have ripped your community a new one. And we're not even the best of our group. Wade cocked a brow at his companion, giving him a stare that said, Really? Brett simply shrugged sheepishly. Be that as it may, the man from the back called. We can't exactly go back to Mr. Harris empty-handed, especially after the damage you've done. Brett grinned as the wheels turned in his head, snowballing the bluff. Nobody is saying that you have to, he insisted. In fact, if I were in your shoes, I'd figure out where old Ted has gone and run in the opposite direction. We're just the tip of the spear, and there's a whole lot more like us coming. You think you're having trouble fighting off a handful of us? Just wait until there are hundreds of us turning our might and fury upon you. More silence, and the soldiers exchanged a charged look both praying in their own way that these guys were going to take the bait. They were totally fucked if they didn't. You may have more skill and experience than us, but don't think for a second that we can't shoot, the man finally called, though his voice shook. If I were you, I'd spend the next ten minutes or so contemplating my future before taking a step outside of this house. Bretz raised a victory fist. You're making a smart play here, he commended. There may be hope for you yet. We're headed west, and if you're smart, you and your friends won't pursue us, the man warned. Only thing I plan on doing is getting a beer and a nap in, Bretz assured him. Tracking you across open terrain isn't on my agenda. Another short silence. Good, came the reply. See that it stays that way. The chosen member let out a loud whistle. Leave him be, he bellowed. Let's move out. The soldiers remained on high alert, not leaving their posts just in case it was a trick. After a few tense minutes of silence, their shoulders relaxed, and they slumped against the floor. Next time I suggest we take on an entire army of men, trained or not, just smack me on the back of the head, call me a dumbass and give me a proper order, Wade complained, scrubbing his hands down his face. Brett shot him a glare. You damn well better believe that's what's going to happen, he agreed. Also, Wade added, raising a finger, Remind me never to play poker with you. With you as convincing as you are, you'll have me believing your seven deuces a royal flush. The corporal smirked. Don't have to worry about that, he said. I know what our paychecks look like, so it's not like you'd have much to lose anyway. They shared a laugh, breathing a sigh of relief and taking a brief reprieve from all the work that was still left to be done. Chapter 5 Copeland stared at the wounded chosen soldier as one of the captives patched him up. Normally the sergeant would let a loathsome slaver like this bleed and suffer, but he needed more information, which was more important than pain. Plus, there would be time for that later. The young nurse, a woman that looked to be in her mid-twenties, applied a bandage to his gunshot wound. She taped it up tight, and the chosen captive winced. Easy here, he hissed. Shut your mouth, she snapped. You're lucky I'm not digging my finger in there. She got to her feet, swiping her palms against each other. You going to live? Copeland asked from his seat next to the wounded man. Bleeding has stopped, the nurse confirmed. But just say the word and I can make it start back up again. The sergeant nodded. As soon as our chat is finished, you'll be the first one I call, he assured her. The nurse got to her feet and the captive sneered at her. Yeah. You run along now, little girl. The menfolk have some grown-up business to attend to, he said. 
She jutted out her chin and glanced to Copeland, who gave her a slight nod of permission. She reached out and flicked his wound hard with her index finger, causing him to whimper. More like a boy getting talked down to by a real man, she declared with a grin, and walked off. Claudia passed her, approaching and taking a seat next to Copeland, stretching her legs across the hallway. I can handle this, the sergeant said. I'm sure you can, but after what he's put me— She choked on the last word and took a deep breath to regroup. After what he's put us all through— I want to see him squirm. Copeland nodded in understanding. Fair enough, he said. Plus, I take it you're not from the area? Claudia asked. He shook his head. No, ma'am, I'm not, he said. So, don't you think it might be a good idea to have someone who knows the area sit in? She asked. He nodded in approval. Good point, he conceded, and then turned to the captive. So, what do I call you? He asked. Does it matter? The wounded man huffed. Guess not, Copeland agreed with a non-committal shrug. What does matter is that you answer my questions. Shoot your shot, cowboy, the man seethed. Copeland raised a hand and whirled it in the air. Assuming my friends haven't hunted down your little bitch of a leader already, where is his fallback position? He demanded. You act like we only have one, the captive said with a pained sneer. You really think this is the only community we've set up? I don't, but given how piss-poor this one was protected, I'm going to assume the fallback position is going to be, shall we say, a little more fortified? Copeland shot back. The captive managed to chuckle despite his pain. That doesn't really narrow it down, he said. Our army is mighty and vast. The sergeant laughed. So mighty and vast that it got decimated by three soldiers and a pissed-off housewife with a grenade? He drawled. Yeah, real fearsome. Claudia pursed her lips, tapping on her forearm, and Copeland glanced at her. You got something? He asked. She shook her head. Not yet. Keep going, she said. I'll speak up when I have something. Copeland nodded. Okay, he said, and turned back to the wounded man. So... Fortified fallback positions. You gonna start talking, or do I need to call the nurse back in here to have a little fun at your expense? I know I'm dead either way, the captive said with a dark grin. So at least I can die knowing I sent you and yours to an early grave. I'll tell you what you want to know. There's a major munitions plant to the north of downtown. Biggest one in the region. State-of-the-art compound. High levels of security. Not something you'll be able to just walk into. If you made the mistake of letting Mr. Harris out of here alive, that's where he's going to. Copeland looked at Claudia. Do you know the place? he asked. She gritted her teeth and nodded. Yeah, they made us go and work there to get it set up, she said. It's no joke. How bad we talking? the sergeant asked. Reinforced walls, heavy gate at the front, guard towers, she replied. It's like they took the design plans of a prison and turned it into a munitions factory. If you try to go up against Ted there, you'd better have a lot of body bags ready, the wounded man declared, despite his shaky voice. This community that you destroyed, ruining the lives of so many innocent people, this was nothing. This was us trying to find a bit of normality in a devastated world. But you unleash the beast, and when you go there, you're going to find out. Copeland ignored him completely, still staring at Claudia. Any idea how many civilians were in this compound? He asked. If we're doing a full-scale assault, it would be nice to know they weren't in harm's way. I don't know, she replied, shaking her head. Fifty? A hundred? They didn't really let us outside all that much. Not like we were having community picnics or anything. The captive let out a strangled laugh. You don't get it. We're on a war footing because of your invasion he hissed. There are no civilians, no families that are going to be in harm's way. Our boys have been training for this fight for years, and now that you've brought it to our doorstep, you're going to find out just how fearsome we are. All of us. If you aren't taking the families to the fortified plant, where are you taking them? Copeland asked, finally directing his attention back to their captive. Do you really think we're the only ones in this part of the country who are self-sufficient? The wounded man hissed. Tens of thousands of like-minded individuals, stretching from here to the coast, living free from government tyranny for years, 
decades. Before the collapse, we existed in our own little bubbles. But after we were abandoned by those sworn to protect this country, we took matters into our own hands. You may have thought you were dealing with a small group of backwoods yokels, but you have no idea the size of the hornet's nest you just kicked, boy. Copeland's gut twisted with uneasiness, but he kept his facial expression calm and neutral. His mind raced as he stared at the wounded captive, trying to get a read on him. If he was bluffing, it was extremely effective. For the time being, Copeland had to go forward like the man was telling the truth. You got anything to add? the sergeant asked, eyeing Claudia. She shrugged. Only that when we were at the plant setting up their defenses, I saw people that never came to this camp, she said. Strong, heavily armed people. Copeland nodded. That definitely added points to the column of this man telling the truth. This not only added to their danger, but put them on an extremely tight timeline. Shit, he muttered. Shit's right, boy, the captive exclaimed, far more excited in his eyes than his broken body. You and your friends are in a whole heap of trouble. You just don't even know. As soon as our families are safe, our friends are gonna come put a world of hurt on you. Not only you, but anybody who's helped you out in the slightest. Hell, if someone saw you and didn't try to put a bullet in your head, they're gonna get a bullet of their own. You may think Mr. Harris is a monster, but he's a teddy bear compared to what's heading your way. Copeland shook his head during the diatribe, realizing that he wasn't going to get any more information out of the excitable captive. He glanced at Claudia. Guess there's only one thing left to do, he said, and then raised his voice. Nurse! Patient is yours. She entered the hallway, hands behind her back, and stood over the captive, staring down at him as he continued to rant about the world of pain coming to the soldiers. Finally, he paused and looked up at her, giving her a deluded smirk. Oh, I see that look in your eyes, sweetheart, he drawled. Don't worry, my wife is no longer with us. We can have a little fun together. She stared at him some more and gave him a playful little smirk which seemed to excite him in his pain-addled days. After another moment, she brought her hands around to her front, revealing a bright yellow squeeze bottle of lemon juice. "'Seems as though the owners of this house left this behind,' she said. The captive focused on the bottle, and his eyes cleared when he realized what it was, and what he was in for. She reached down, ripped off his bandage, and shoved the tip of the bottle into the wound. "'No, don't, please!' He gasped as he tried to squirm, and then she squeezed the bottle. He screamed, an agonized, deafening sound, limbs locking as he wailed through the pain. After some more blood-curdling screaming, Copeland stood and kicked him in the face, knocking him out. Blood poured down the front of the captive's face from a broken nose, and he slumped to the floor. The sergeant patted the nurse on the shoulder. Remind me to stay on your good side, he said. She gave him a sheepish shrug and got to her feet. "'What do you want me to do with him?' she asked. "'Claudia, your call,' Copeland said. She got up as well, swiping her palms together. "'Normally I'd say put a bullet in his head and be done with it,' she said. "'But that's too easy.' She jerked a thumb over her shoulder. "'Get a couple of the others, tie him up tight and stick his ass in a closet. Maybe he lives, maybe he dies a slow and painful death, which is what he deserves. Regardless, he's out of our hair.' The nurse nodded and headed off to make it happen, and a middle-aged man brushed past her to approach the remaining duo. "'Miss Claudia, I think we're packed up and ready to go,' he said. She crossed her arms. "'Got all the food and water?' she asked. "'Yes, ma'am,' he replied with emphatic nods. "'Everybody has what they can carry. Just need to know where you want us to stage it.' Claudia looked at Copeland, and the sergeant walked over to the front of the house. He peeked out the window at the fifty or so zombies hanging out front. He tilted his head back and forth for a moment as he thought, and then nodded confidently, turning back from the glass. I've only known you for a few minutes, Claudia drawled, raising a hand, but whatever is in your head looks like trouble. He motioned behind him. Stage everything at the front door, he said to the man, and get me anything that can make noise. Alarm clocks, apples, I don't care, just something I can throw. The man nodded and ran off, leaving Claudia standing there with raised eyebrows. "'Alarm clocks and apples?' she asked dryly. Copeland shrugged. 
These things are attracted by noise, he explained. Gonna go up top and start chucking stuff down the block. If I'm lucky, I'll pull some away before the others get here with our ride. And if you aren't lucky? she asked. Then we're gonna be fighting our way out of here, the sergeant replied. She nodded sharply. Let me see what I can find, she said. You go up top and I'll bring it up. Copeland nodded and climbed back up to the attic, making his way back up to the roof. He sat at the top by the hatch, looking out at the moonlit street. The amount of zombies milling about tightened his chest, and he shook his head. Bretts, Wade, you boys better come through, he thought, because if you don't, I have no clue how I'm getting these people out of this. Chapter 6 Bretts and Wade continued to sit in their defensive positions, like they had for the previous ten minutes. There hadn't been a peep from anyone in that time, not even a shambling zombie. Finally, Wade relaxed his aim, and the corporal did the same. Pretty sure they've gone, the sniper said. If not, kudos to them for playing the long game, Bretts muttered. Wade tilted his head. The truck shouldn't be too much further up, he said. Block, block and a half. Then we just have to find the keys, hope it starts, rescue Sarge along with a ton of civilians, and escape a zombie-infested hellscape, Brett said, counting off the things on his fingers. Well, when you put it like that, it sounds like a cakewalk, the sniper drawled. Brett chuckled, and they got up, moving towards the front of the house. The soldiers looked back towards the escape point, finding it deserted, with a lot more dead bodies in the road than when they'd first arrived. Looks like we put a dent in their numbers, Brett said. So did our undead allies, Wade added. Now we just have to hope there aren't too many of them running around. The corporal shook his head. Nothing but the bright side of life from you, is it, bud? he asked. Why do you think the Sarge likes to keep me around? Wade joked. Come on, let's move, Brett said, and they headed out the back, keeping their weapons primed and ready for whatever threat was coming their way. They worked their way up to the next house, and then footsteps echoed behind them. The soldiers whipped around to face a fresh ghoul sprinting towards them. Wade aimed, but Bretts pushed his barrel down. If there's more of them out there, the corporal murmured, we don't want them to know we're here. The sniper nodded and shouldered his gun, grabbing his knife. Bretts stepped up, and as the zombie lunged for him, he grabbed its arm and spun it around, flinging it to the ground. Wade immediately leapt onto its back, putting his knee into its spine before stabbing violently downward. The blade easily penetrated the skull, and Wade drove it in a few times, causing some convulsions before the corpse fell limp. He wiped his blade clean before nodding to Bretts and getting up. They moved up the block and stopped at the corner house, looking out towards the intersection to get a good look at the situation. There were three zombies in the road, wandering aimlessly and looking for a target. Do you see the truck? Bretts whispered. Wade raised his rifle, scanning the opposite side of the street. Got it, he finally said, stopping his movement on their target. Three houses down. What are the odds these three are slow movers? Bretts murmured. With the way our day is going? Wade asked. The corporal sighed. Yeah, you're right, he huffed, and looked around the side of the house at a rock-covered flowerbed halfway up. He moved cautiously towards it, staying concealed in the darkness, and grabbed a fair-sized rock. He threw it as hard as he could towards the house across the street, and it landed with a thud on the paved driveway, echoing through the air. All three ghouls in the street immediately sprinted towards the noise, and Bretts wasted no time, motioning for Wade to get moving as he grabbed another rock. The soldiers ran across the street, moving up a couple of houses so they were directly across from the target house. Bretts glanced down the street towards the runners, who had made their way back to the road after investigating the rock noise about forty yards away. Wade scanned the house. Truck is parked facing away from the road, he said quietly. Back gated door is open halfway, no movement inside. Driver's side door is also open. What about the house? Bretts whispered. Light is on inside, the sniper reported as he slowly scanned the house. Curtains in front window have been ripped down, smudges on the window, but don't see any movement. So either those three came from the house, the corporal trailed off, shaking his head, or we're in for a surprise when we get there. Guess which one my money's on, 
Wade muttered. Brett's pursed his lips, sighing at how much light was cast by the solar lights lining the road. No matter what we do, we're going to be spotted crossing the road, which means we're going to have to work fast, he whispered. You check the cab for the keys. I'll secure the house. If they're in there, we move. And if not, Wade asked. The corporal shrugged. Then we gotta go inside, he said. More than likely, one of those things is going to have it in its pocket. There's forty yards or so separating us from those runners, the sniper reminded him. That's only going to buy us a few seconds from when they spot us. Bretts nodded. I know, he admitted. If the keys aren't in the cab, you take them out by any means necessary. Understood, Wade replied. The duo checked their guns, and Wade put a fresh magazine into his rifle, giving him five shots. They nodded to each other and then rushed across the street. The noise they were making didn't matter. Speed mattered. As soon as their boots hit pavement, the sound attracted the runners down the block and eyed them before diving for the truck cab. He jumped in, quickly putting his hand on the ignition, but finding no keys. Fuck, he muttered, and then aimed at the sprinting threat. He fired quickly, obliterating the lead ghoul's head and sending the corpse flying back into the grass. The rest were too close, so he didn't have time to line up a headshot and just had to fire. The bullet hit the creature in the shoulder, the force of the short-range rifle shot sending it spinning backwards to the ground and buying him a few precious seconds. Wade tossed his rifle behind him into the cab, pulling out his handgun and honing in on the zombie within five yards. He didn't have clear aim yet, just firing. The first few bullets hit the creature in the chest, slowing it down slightly. This gave Wade a chance to adjust his aim and find his target, delivering a kill shot to the forehead. Before he could think, he reacted to the other zombie that had popped up from the ground. It turned and let out a loud moan as it began pursuit again. Wade unloaded the remainder of his magazine into the creature, finally hitting its head just before it reached the truck. Wade sat there, smoking gun aimed downrange, breathing heavily for a moment. Finally, he snapped out of it, smacked another mag into the gun, and hopped out to help Bretts. The sniper ran into the house, looking around frantically for his partner. Bretts, he hissed. A commotion sounded from the living room, and Wade rushed in. Two zombies had the corporal pinned to the couch, and though he managed to get his boot firmly planted into the chest of one of them, keeping it at bay, the other one was dangerously close to his cheek, despite his attempts to push it up with his hands. Wade ran over and fired point-blank into the temple of the leg zombie, and the creature flew to the side as he grabbed the other one by the back of the shirt, pulling it off of Brett's and throwing it to the ground. Both men aimed and fired quickly, at least one bullet hitting it in the forehead and ending the threat. "'Holy fuck, you good?' Wade huffed. The corporal gave himself a once-over, too in shock to know if he had been bitten or not. After a thorough inspection, he let out a sigh of relief. "'Yeah, I'm good,' he said. Wade let out a horror laugh and smacked his companion on the arm. "'You're a lucky some bitch, you know that, corporal?' he asked. "'Beginning to look that way,' Bretts replied, shaking his head. "'Come on, we gotta find keys.' The two soldiers dug through the pants of the fallen zombies, neither one of them having any luck. "'Were there any others in here?' Wade asked. The corporal shook his head. "'Nope,' he said. "'Outside ones?' the sniper asked. Bretts shrugged, and they raced outside to loot the fallen out there, too. Before they could begin, however, a dozen ghouls emerged from the shadows across the street. "'Make it quick,' the corporal hissed, and the two men ignored the lumbering threat for the moment to rifle through the pockets of the corpses. Both of their first attempts came up empty, and Wade let out a deep sigh before checking the last one. If the keys weren't there, they were out of luck. Bretts watched with bated breath as Wade dug into the zombie's pockets, and then the sniper let out a noise of triumph, popping up excitedly with the keys. "'You get in the back and let the sergeant know we're inbound,' he said. Bretts nodded and rushed to the back of the truck, throwing up the rolling gate and hopping inside. The zombie slowly marched across the street towards him, but he was unconcerned since the truck was high enough off of the ground that they wouldn't be able to get at him. A moment later, the truck rumbled to life and Wade popped it into reverse. Bretts watched as the truck backed over several zombies, resulting in a satisfying pop as their heads crunched beneath the tires. The corporal pulled out his walkie-talkie. "'Sarge, we're inbound,' he said. 
Hope your people are ready to move. Just tell us where to go. Head towards the zombie-infested house and back that thing up as close to the front door as possible, Copeland replied. There are still a couple dozen of those things out front. You got it, Brett said, and moved to the front of the truck, banging on the wall to get Wade's attention. Back it up to the front door and they'll load up, he yelled. The sniper banged back to let him know the message had been received. Brett's moved to the back again, looking out at the neighborhood as they drove. There were bodies everywhere, with no area safe from the carnage. He shook his head. What a waste, he thought bitterly. The truck rumbled down the road, and he was taken aback at the scene. They rolled by the target house that still had a few dozen zombies in the yard. Their attention quickly switched from the house to the truck, turning and moving towards the loud vehicle. Wade popped the truck into reverse, driving straight across the grass, and smacking into ghoul after ghoul. He missed the front door, crashing right into the front windows. Brett staggered, glancing over his shoulder. Sorry about that, Wade cried, voice faint and muffled by the cab. The corporal rolled his eyes before kicking away broken glass from what was left of the windows. A moment later, Copeland entered the living room, crossing his arms. Somebody order a big-ass taxi? Brett sparked. Guess I should have mentioned that Wade has a suspended license, the sergeant joked. Yeah, that might have been relevant information to have, Brett's replied, and the men laughed, exchanging a fist bump. All right, everybody, grab your stuff and start getting into the truck, Claudia barked, and hopped over the window frame into the truck. We got places to be. Brett's appraised her and cocked his head at Copeland. Where'd you find her at? he asked. The sergeant shrugged. Sometimes good things just magically appear, he said. The soldiers chuckled and then began helping people onto the truck. The horn blared from the front and the soldiers peered outside. The farmer from across the street was doing his best to dodge the zombies and make it to the truck. That damn fool, Copeland muttered. We gotta help him. Bretts nodded and followed him into the house and to the front door. They threw it open and stepped out onto the lawn, taking aim at the zombies and firing at those nearby. They quickly cleared a path to the truck and the farmer made it to the cab, climbing up into the front with Wade. Once he was secured, they moved back into the house and secured the front door behind them. When they reached the living room, it seemed everyone and their stuff had been loaded up. Just waiting on you two, Claudia called from the other side of the window. Copeland motioned for Brett's to go, and followed him through the window. Somebody smack on that wall, will you? Brett's called and one of the civilians by the front gave the cab a few good smacks to let Wade know they were ready to go. The truck popped into gear and lurched away from the house, heading towards the armory. Copeland pulled out his walkie-talkie and switched the channel, bringing it to his lips. "'Dennis, you good?' he asked. There was a moment of silence, and then the reply came through. "'Hey, Sergeant,' Dennis said. "'Yeah, we're good. All quiet over here.' "'How quiet we talking?' Copeland asked. Maybe three or four of the slow zombies that we can see? Came the reply. Nothing else at all. Copeland glanced at Brett's. I think we're going to be in for a hell of a fight, he said firmly. Some extra weapons might do us some good. Let's clear it out then, the corporal agreed. Okay, I want you and Karen to be ready to move, Copeland said into the radio. Just make sure there is a clear path to the back door, because we're going to clear that place out. Thought you might say that. Dennis replied. So we staged some of the heavier-duty items in the kitchen. Copeland barked a laugh. Look at you, following orders and taking initiative. Might just be hope for you yet, he said. Just be ready, because we're coming in hot. Yes, sir, Dennis replied. The truck sped down the road, making the turn towards the armory. It was smooth sailing, with nothing so much as a bump in the road until they arrived. As soon as the truck stopped, Brett's, Copeland, and Claudia hopped down out of the back. The sergeant moved to the side of the truck, looking down the street towards the front gate that was several blocks away. He spotted a handful of zombies in the road, slowly shambling towards them. Start getting stuff loaded up, Copeland instructed. I'm going to talk to Wade. If you find any more grenades, send them my way. Brett's nodded, and he and Claudia rushed into the house, a few of the stronger-looking men of hers in tow. As they loaded up, Copeland leaned against the driver's side door. My friend get in okay? he asked. Oh, yes, sir. I'm here and happy to be so, 
the farmer replied from the passenger seat. Yeah, he's good, Wade replied. Excitable, but good. All right, Copeland said. So, the last time I was at the front gate, it was a full-scale war. I'm assuming some have been pulled away, given how much noise we've been making. But we have to be ready for a fight. The sniper nodded. Pretty sure I can pick up enough speed in this thing to plow through them, he said, patting the steering wheel. Copeland shook his head. We gotta get the survivors out of the other house first, he said. Wade took a deep breath. All right, we can try, he said, though he didn't sound convinced. But if there's a mob of those things, we're going to have a hell of a time. Claudia approached, tapping Copeland on the shoulder. He turned and accepted the two grenades she held out to him. Thank you, he said with a smile. Don't mention it, she said, and then ran back to her task. The sergeant held the grenades up to the sniper. You were saying? he asked. Well, hop up front here, and let's get this done, Wade replied, shaking his head. Don't know about you, but I'm ready to be in a less zombified situation. Copeland turned to the house, spotting Brett's and letting out a whistle to get his attention. How are we looking? he asked. Two more minutes, and we'll have the place cleared out, the corporal called back. Good man, Copeland said, and skirted the cab, pushing the farmer over to the center seat as he climbed in. He checked his assault rifle, and then cocked his head to the farmer. You know anything about the civilian jail at the front gate? he asked. The man shook his head. Not much, he admitted. I see them take people in and out of there all the time. I don't know any of them, though. They typically use those people for local jobs that the uppity-ups don't want to do. Everybody that got put with me did farm work. All right, Copeland replied. Whatever the situation is, we're going to get it right and be on our way. A few smacks against the back of the truck prompted Wade to fire it up, and he took a deep breath. Here we go, the sniper said, and drove up a few blocks, stopping just one short of the front gate. The scene was horrific. Bodies were strewn everywhere, a hundred or so still standing and milling about. The silver lining, at least, was that there were very few past the gate opening, which was more than large enough for the truck to pass through. Your show, Sergeant, Wade said. Copeland studied the mass of bodies around the target house. Outside his door there was no immediate threat, and he pulled the handle. Be right back, he said, and hopped out of the truck, walking a few yards up. He pulled out a grenade, popped the pin, and threw it with everything he had. The grenade landed in the middle of the pack, making enough noise that the ghouls turned towards it, just in time for it to explode, sending rotten body parts flying through the air. Copeland readied a second one, but before he could pull the pin, Wade let out a honk. Confused, the sergeant ran back to the truck, popping up to speak through the open window. "'What is it?' he asked. Both the farmer and Wade pointed towards the target house. Copeland followed their fingers, and his heart sank at the sight of the front door. It was smashed open, hanging on its hinges, and zombies poured out of the building, a few of them running fast. Damn, the sergeant muttered. We were too late. We did what we could, Sarge, Wade said. Copeland grunted. I know, but... He trailed off helplessly. Sarge? the sniper said firmly. We have a truck full of people who are alive because of us. Now come on, let's get them and us to safety. Copeland sighed and got in, slamming the door in frustration behind him. Wade put the truck in gear and punched the gas. Hang on back there, he bellowed loud enough for the civilians to hear. This is going to get bumpy. There was a smack on the wall in response, letting them know the message had been received. Wade floored it and the truck eviscerated the first few straggler zombies it came into contact with. There was enough force to bounce the majority of the creatures that approached it. They hit the front gate at a high speed, crashing through it and sawing off. Copeland looked in the side mirror at the smoldering mess of a compound. Part of him was proud of the fact they'd been able to strike a blow against the Chosen and save some captives. He tried desperately to focus on that, because the victory had come at such a high cost. Chapter 7 The truck approached Kuna as the sun began to peek up over the horizon. The main road was clogged with hundreds of corpses, causing Wade to stop in the middle of the street. What in the holy hell happened here? 
the farmer drawled. Copeland blinked. That's an excellent question, old-timer, he said. Bretts has our radio, Sarge, Wade said. Copeland stared out, hoping for the best, but stunned at what he was seeing. He swallowed hard and pulled out his radio, turning it to the correct frequency. Captain Kersey, this is Sergeant Copeland, he said hoarsely. Do you copy? The few moments of silence in the cab were tense, both soldiers holding their breath. Beginning to wonder if you'd gone AWOL, Sergeant. Kersey came back, and Copeland and Wade breathed a sigh of relief. The sergeant let out an exasperated laugh. The thought did cross my mind, sir, but I ultimately decided to come back, he said. As you no doubt have noticed, you're going to have to take a side road into town, the captain said. We had some, uh, troubles. I can see that, Copeland replied, shaking his head. We'll be there shortly. Wade put the truck into gear, making the turn down a side street, and eventually reaching the front gate. As it opened, he spotted a few dozen civilians there, along with all the soldier companions flanked by Yvonne and Zeke. Wade drove in and parked off to the side, and as they hopped out, Bretts and Claudia began helping to unload their civilian rescues. Kowalski, Baker, Dawson, Kersey barked. Go give them a hand. They replied in the affirmative in unison, and walked towards the truck. Looking a little worse for wear there, Baker, Wade drawled as they passed each other. Baker winked at him. Just a flesh wound. I'll live, he said. How'd it go in Nampa? Kersey asked. Ted Harris escaped, but we put a serious hurt on him and his men, Copeland replied. The captain nodded. Nicely done, sergeant, he said. We do have an urgent situation that we need to deal with sooner rather than later, Copeland said. Okay, Kersey replied. Let's get everyone together and... Screams erupted from the truck, and the soldiers all turned to see Kowalski pointing a handgun into the crowd. Kowalski! What the hell are you doing? Kersey cried as they ran over. These are the pricks who sold me out! The sniper snarled. Poisoned me and tried to sell me into slavery so they could get a taste of the good life! Copeland stepped forward. Kowalski, there. They're going to get a bullet in the face is what they're going to get! The sniper snapped. Karen sobbed, clutching Dennis as he fell to his knees. Please, sir, please, he begged. I'm sorry for what we did to you. Shut up, Kowalski snapped. You shut the fuck up! He stepped forward and pressed the barrel of the gun against Dennis's temple. That's enough, Kersey barked. Not yet it isn't, Captain, Kowalski snarled. Copeland raised a hand to the captain and then moved forward, leaning into the sniper and keeping his voice at a whisper. As he relayed what the couple had been through, namely Karen, Kowalski's arm sagged and he lowered his gun, taking a step back. You got what you deserved, the sniper said, though the venom was gone from his voice. Next time you feel like fucking someone over, you damn well better remember what happened this time. Karen collapsed into her husband and he hugged her tightly, looking at the sky as if to thank God for sparing him. And if you see me walking on one side of the street, you damn well better cross over to the other side, Kowalski warned. Are we clear? Yes, yes, sir, Dennis stammered. I'm sorry, sir. Copeland patted Kowalski on the back and gently led him back to Kersey, who stood with Yvonne and Zeke. Everything okay, son? Yvonne asked. The sniper nodded begrudgingly. Yes, ma'am, he said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. I'm sorry for making a scene in your community. Oh, don't you worry about it, she replied, waving a hand at him. I've gotten a good sense of who you are over these last few days, and if they got you to do that, there's a good chance that it wasn't something inconsequential. Kersey eyed the sniper. You good? he asked sternly. Yes, sir, Kowalski replied, meeting his gaze to show his sincerity. Good, Kersey said, satisfied. Baker, get the others. We need to have a chat. Yvonne, can we use your office? Of course, she said with a nod. As long as you don't mind Zeke and I attending, I get the feeling that this is going to impact us. The captain nodded. Wouldn't have it any other way, he assured her. Baker, Copeland said as the private turned to head off. Get a young lady named Claudia as well. We're going to need her knowledge. Yvonne patted Zeke on the shoulder. Why don't you go grab a few of those nice boxed breakfasts for our returning soldiers and their lady friend, she suggested. 
I'm guessing they didn't get a meal break last night. He nodded and hurried off, and she motioned for the soldiers to follow her as Baker returned with the rest of the group and Claudia. Come on, she said. I got a coffee maker in my office with your name written all over it. As they headed towards the office, Claudia marveled at their surroundings. This is a really nice place you've built here, ma'am, she breathed. Oh, don't start with that ma'am nonsense, Yvonne drawled, waving her off. You gonna make me feel old? Call me Yvonne. Sure, Claudia replied with a smile. You were locked up at the chosen compound? The Kuna leader asked. Claudia nodded. Yes, ma'am, Yvonne she said. It, it wasn't pleasant. Well, you are home now, sugar, Yvonne assured her. Sergeant Copeland here seems to have taken a shine to you, which is good enough in my book. Claudia swallowed hard. Thank you, she said, her voice thick. They reached the office, and Zeke was already there with a pile of breakfast boxes next to him. Kersey took the floor. Okay, now that everybody is here, he said, why don't you tell us what the trouble is, Sergeant? Copeland nodded. Thank you, Captain, he said. In clearing the compound in Nampa, I interrogated one of the Chosen about where Ted Harris and his men would retreat to. After a little prodding, he said there was a munitions factory to the north of town. Newest and biggest one around, built like a prison that they turned into a fortress. Baker shrugged. If they want to go and hide there, let them, he drawled. We can bide our time until our reinforcements come, then neutralize them. Copeland shook his head. I wish it was that easy, he said. We may not have the luxury of time. Why not? Baker asked, furrowing his brow. He volunteered that they were allied with much larger militia movements in the Northwest, the sergeant explained. As you know, before civilization went to shit, this region was a hotbed for those kinds of organizations. Seems our lack of a cohesive military response inspired them to link up and join forces. Baker paled. Shit, he said. Exactly. Copeland agreed. Which means if we don't make a decisive strike now, Brett's piped up, they might get reinforcements before we do, and ours might not be enough to hold them off. How long of a timetable do we have? Kowalski asked. Copeland shook his head. Unknown, but likely not more than a day, he said. How do you figure that? The sniper shot back, raising an eyebrow. We saw them evacuating civilians from the compound last night, Wade said and my interrogation subject said in pretty plain terms that Ted Harris wouldn't put them in danger if he knew a full-scale war was on his doorstep. Copeland finished. And you believed him, Sarge? Dawson asked. I did, yeah, Copeland replied honestly. So best we can figure, Bretz continued, as soon as those civilians get to the safety of another compound, reinforcements will be incoming. Kowalski took a deep breath, shaking his head. So we have a day to launch a full-scale offensive against a prison-like fortress, he asked. Surely it can't be that difficult, can it? Claudia, Copeland asked, motioning to her. She looked around and gave a little wave. For those who haven't met me yet, my name is Claudia, she said. For the last several weeks, I was one of the captive slaves held by the Chosen, and one of our main tasks was building the defenses at this fallback compound. She looked around and spotted a whiteboard against the far wall, motioning to it. May I? she asked. Please do, Yvonne said, waving her over. It's all yours. Claudia picked up the eraser, cleaning the whiteboard and then uncapping a marker. This is the munitions compound, she said, drawing a big square, and then continued to speak as she added things to the crude map. There are eight-foot-high concrete walls surrounding the building, with a massive iron gate at the front and side entrances to the building. In each corner at the front are two towers, standing about twenty yards off of the ground. So we have to worry about snipers? Baker piped up. Claudia shook her head. Worse, she said. We spent a full day hauling up all the mechanisms to install fifty cal machine guns on both of them. The room fell deathly silent for a moment, until Kowalski threw up his hands. Where in the holy fuck did they find those? he asked. I don't think they were local pickups, Claudia replied. While working, we saw some other trucks pull in with equipment, and people we only saw at this compound. Oh, great, the sniper drawled, rolling his eyes. So the militia friends have access to military hardware. So why aren't we waiting on reinforcements? Because we won't be able to handle them if the reinforcements get here before ours do, Copeland said flatly. And maybe not even after that. 
There was another silence as that sank in, and then Kersey cleared his throat. If we manage to take control of this compound before their friends get here, then there's a chance they'll ride off this territory, he mused. Not wanting to risk lives and equipment to try and take back an area the U.S. military has taken control of. Oh, is that all? Kowalski scoffed. I'm sure the seven and a half of us can manage to take it out. Baker poked him in the ribs. Hey, he said. Am I wrong? Kowalski asked, eyeing his injury. Baker scowled. Well, no, he muttered, wincing as he tried to move it. You got eight and a half, if you include me, Claudia said, turning to face the group. At Kersey's skeptical stare, she continued. Served in the National Guard, so I know enough to be dangerous. Plus, I know the compound, which is more than any of you can say. The captain shared a look with Copeland, and then shrugged. Okay, we'll make that work, he said, and then leaned back against Yvonne's desk. But we're going to need a hell of a plan if we're going to pull this off. Kowalski? Sir? the sniper asked. Go work with Claudia on the layout of this place, Kersey instructed. Anything we can use to our advantage, any place we might be able to get an edge. Details, details, details. On it, Cap, Kowalski said, and joined her at the whiteboard. Before Kersey could issue any more orders, Yvonne put a hand on his shoulder. Captain, I have to say that I am not a hundred percent on board with you wiping out the Chosen, she said. He took a deep breath. I'm not thrilled with it either, he admitted. But if what Copeland says is true, and they have well-armed reinforcements coming, then we could be putting off a full-scale war by doing this. A war that would no doubt come to your doorstep, given how much you have helped us out. She chewed over that for a moment, and then gave a begrudging nod. It is not the option that I would prefer to go with, she said. But it might be the only option we have. You have my support, Captain. Zeke here will get you everything you need. Thank you, Kersey said. I greatly appreciate it. She nodded, and then headed for the coffee maker, turning on the burner. Baker, Johnson, go with Zeke and inventory the new weaponry that's been brought in, Kersey continued. Focus on higher-end stuff, explosives, anything that can give us an edge. There was a chorus of, yes, sir, and the trio headed off. Bretz, Dawson, give Kowalski a hand with the planning, Kersey said, and then joined the sergeant. Copeland, you and Wade outside with me for a moment. They headed outside, and he led them to a nice spot in the shade, taking a seat at a picnic table. Once they were situated, Kersey folded his hands on the table. You two raided their compound and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, en masse, the captain said. What are their capabilities? The soldiers exchanged a look, and then Wade took a deep breath. Honestly, sir, the only reason I'm standing here is because we had enough zombies and runners to provide us cover, he admitted. And even then... It took a hell of a bluff on Brett's part to keep us from being overrun. Kersey nodded. And you, Sergeant? he asked. Copeland shrugged. I had a pissed-off housewife with a hand grenade that bailed me out, he replied. She opened up the fence to the zombie mob in the first place. We definitely have the skill and experience advantage on them. But we're only standing here right now thanks to the element of surprise and some dumb luck. He shook his head. Raiding this compound is going to be something else. I mean... We can certainly do it, but we're going to need our A-game if we're going to survive it. Kersey nodded thoughtfully. Understood, gentlemen, he said. Thank you for your candor. Why don't you two grab Brett's and get a bite to eat? Take a breather, because I think that's all you're going to get today. If it's all the same to you, sir, I think we'd rather get to planning this operation, Copeland replied. Speak for yourself, Sarge, Wade countered. I'm a growing boy and need my breakfast. Copeland chuckled. Maybe it's just me, then, he said. No, Kersey said firmly. Grab Brett's and get some food. That's an order. Twenty minutes of planning isn't going to change the outcome of this operation. Now go. They both replied in the affirmative and headed back inside, leaving Kersey alone. He looked out over the town, civilians new and old, enjoying their safety. Raiding the factory was going to be challenging, and may cost even more lives of his teammates. But if they didn't try then all of these civilians would be marked for death. Yvonne slid in next to him, setting down a mug of coffee. Oh, thank you, he said, offering her a tight smile. I've seen that look on faces before, she said, wagging a finger at him as she took a sip of her own brew. What's on your mind, Captain? He sighed. Just reminding myself of why I fight, he said. 
We could play it safe, hope that the information Copeland was given was incorrect. But if we're wrong, all of this, all of what you've built, all of this innocent life is wiped away. It's not something that I'm willing to take a chance on. That's what makes you a good person, Captain, Yvonne said firmly. Far too little of that going around these days. And even though I'm not particularly fond of some of the methods you have to take to reach the desired outcome, I do understand why you have to do it that way. And I am greatly appreciative of what you are doing. If those people out there knew what I know, they'd tell you the same thing. Kersey nodded, and they sat in silence for a time. I know you have some contemplating to do, so I'll let you get to it, she said, and got to her feet. You need more coffee, and you know where to find it. He offered her a smile. Thank you, he said. Any time, Captain, she said, giving his shoulder a reassuring squeeze. Any time. She headed inside, leaving Kersey to his thoughts. He tried to wrap his mind around yet another fight with impossible odds that had landed on his doorstep. Another one that they'd have to come out on top of, or else so much innocent life would be lost. The End Up next... The Battle of Idaho concludes. <laughs>